Good morning, and welcome to Worship at Trinity. I wish I could say it's good to see you, but I can't see you. So I will say that I'm imagining seeing you, and that's a very good thing to imagine. I'm here with the announcements. Number one, there is a new Steeped in the Faith Bible study on the Psalms of Ascent, co-led by Gwen Palmer and Reverend Jackson at 8 p.m. on Zoom. Please see your Steeped in the Faith reminder for the link. Announcement number two. We are in the second week of our People of Hope stewardship campaign. You'll hear more about this today as we celebrate what God has done through Trinity in 2020 and pursue God's vision for Trinity in 2021 to be a beacon of hope, shining brighter than ever in difficult times when everyone really needs that. We know that our calling is to reach out to each other and to the broader community with our heart, our head, and our hands. I'm glad we're able to do the Lord's work together. Thank you. Hi, Trinity family. I just want to touch base with you this week again on the stewardship campaign we're in called A People of Hope. What this is all about is that in these dark and difficult times, we believe that more than ever, we are called to be a people of light and a people of hope. That as we look to 2021, we want to be good stewards of the gifts that we have to take our little flames, bring them together and shine brighter than ever. Um, this is a time for gratitude for what God has done this year, and uh, you'll hear from Felix Markham today celebrating the work that we've been able to do, being good stewards of this beautiful building that we're in. We're not in this week, but that we are in every week, um, and we celebrate that gift, and we, we're good stewards of that gift going forward, so we're going to celebrate other things, other things that come to mind as we're just looking at this year, um, this iconic year of 2020. Um, we, we haven't had um, any of our members get COVID. We've been able to worship at home and adapt in this moment because of you. Because of your generosity, we've been able to adapt and do virtual worship, to do fellowship hour, to do adapt the steeple and adapt these studies that we do to be able to go virtual. And not only that, um, next week we're actually um, going to get a, a, a whole new set of equipment. We've really been on a, on a shoestring budget, pulling together what we've been doing. But um, because of you, we're able to create this infrastructure for live stream so that we have more reliable, um, more um, 
more high quality um, virtual worship for you to enjoy and to reach more people in the coming year through this medium of virtual worship. Um, we, we've been able to hire Allison, who's been this incredible asset, um, has taken our steeple to where it's never been before um, and has just a treasure trove of ideas um, to be able to be a good witness and a light in our community downtown. We've been able to um, give to C4C and come up with creative ideas to be able to reach. And we have some more things we hope to be sharing with you soon about partnerships um, growing in our community in that direction. And we're, we're going to be releasing these Advent guides and these Advent wreaths um, on November 22nd on our Drive Up Celebration Sunday, Consecration Sunday. Um, from 3 to 4, you can come to our front steps and drop off your commitment card that you should be getting in the mail that you've already gotten in the mail. Um, and you can drop off these commitment cards for our uh, Consecration Sunday on November 22nd from 3 to 4 and pick up as a thank you and a gift a, um, uh, a little gift bag that will have your Advent guide that's going to have lyrics and liturgy. It's going to have the Advent Devo in it. It's going to have um, tons of little things, things for kids, um, Chris Mon cutouts, it's just going to be packed with stuff to make this at home worship experience this Christmas meaningful, um, which is going to be so tough to not be in person for many of us, but it's going to be meaningful because you not only have this Advent Devo, you also have this Advent wreath that we're sending. And so you'll actually be able to follow on, um, follow along in the virtual worship and light a candle there in your household. So all of these things we celebrate, and it's because of you that we've been able to do these kind of things um, this past year. But we want to dream bigger. Um, we want to we want to dream for a bigger impact um, and to be able to care for you better in these difficult times and be a light as we draw our lights together to our community to witness to God's goodness in these times in the upcoming year. So that's what this is all about. That's what this People of Hope stewardship campaign is all about. So. We invite you to join in this. We, we invite you to commit. There's several ways to commit through the steeple. There's a link there. Um, that you can read more about um, this campaign. Um, you should have gotten a letter in the mail that has the, a, little, a little bit more information and a commitment card. And we invite you to come on November 22nd and drop off that commitment card. Pick up your Advent guide and your Advent wreath as a thank you. And be able to kind of say hey to Trinity if it's been a while to the building there. Know that if you're not able to do that, of course, we're going to be um, trying to drop off um, distance and safe um, those Advent guides and, and wreaths. And um, we'll deliver those we're not able to drop off. But know that everybody in the Trinity family will be getting one of those regardless. So um, we're so excited to be um, celebrating this, um, this stewardship season this year. Um, and we invite you to participate and celebrate with us as we look to the next year and dream about what God can do through Trinity UMC in the year to come. We want to be a people of hope. May we be so in the coming year. Good morning, I'm Felix Markham. During this pandemic time, while the church has been closed, we've been addressing many of the physical needs in the building to prepare for our return to in-person worship and full activities. For example, in partnership with Habitat an open table, we have refinished floors on the second floor corridor and the basement level of our educational wing to make our church safer and more inviting. In addition, we have refinished our outside entrance doors to the sanctuary and we've completed landscaping maintenance in our Buchanan courtyard. The work at Trinity is possible in no small part thanks to the years of your generosity, support, prayers and service. As we move into our stewardship campaign as people of hope, please remember 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 through 12. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us.
to uphold us to this very hour. We give ourselves to be faithful to your church through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Trusting in your Son to strengthen Today we have two readings from the New Testament. The first is Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No. There will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour. Our second reading is from the book of James, chapter 1, verse 27, the translation by The Voice. Real, true religion, from God the Father's perspective, is about caring for the orphans and widows who suffer needlessly and resisting the evil influence of the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Trinity. It is my great joy and honor to be with you today. I think it's a privilege to be with you on a week like this week, and I want you to know that I cherish that opportunity. This week, as Pastor Daniel and I were talking through how to have a response <laughs> to a really challenging week like this one, I asked him if we could talk together today from the parsonage, if I could preach from home today. I believe that God um, wants to enter into our spaces, into our living room, into the place that we have navigated the hardship of this week and speak a word of hope and life. So to that end, will you join me in a word of prayer before we get going? God, I ask that once more you would make my pen be like my, my tongue, be like the pen of a ready writer, God. We need a word from you. We need a word of hope, of healing, of restoration, of vision. Vision for a future that is good, that is full of healing and flourishing for ourselves and for our neighbor. I ask that you would speak that word of truth today. And I pray these things in the name that is still above every other name, Jesus, Jesus, amen. So today's lectionary text, Matthew uh, 25 verses one to 13, if you're following along, it's an eschatological text, which means that it's talking about the return of Christ. Like what, what a text to be reading on a week like this week when it feels like everything has fallen apart. There's some irony in there, but as I was leaning into this text, it, it reminded me of a time that I came across the story when I was a few years younger. During undergrad, a group of my friends and I um, were kind of given this task to play this out, like Sunday school style, acting it out. So we did it um, in front of our congregation. And for those of you who are new to the text, it's a story about kind of two different groups of bridesmaids who have been tasked with 
the preparation of preparing this wedding for this groom who's been gone out of town overseas for years and years and they finally get the news that he's he's on the way back he's coming back and so half of the group of bridesmaids are ready they've got oil in their lamp they're ready to welcome him they're ready to greet him and the other half are completely unprepared and so the group of girls that have been goofing off and not prepared run around and they're trying to get oil in their lamps and ultimately they're not ready and when the when the groom returns they don't they're not ready to welcome him and they're not welcomed into the wedding feast can be a really challenging text, but um, I think that my group of friends and I just kind of took it at face value and we're like, okay, we're gonna have flashlights and half of us, our lights are gonna be working, the other half, our lights aren't gonna be working. And remember we put on these white robes and of course I was the director, so I'm telling everyone how to play it out. And we have this girl who's this excellent narrator who's pronouncing the text like, then the kingdom of heaven shall be compared. And she does this really theatrical, wonderful presentation of the text. And uh, right at the last minute, one of the girls is a no-show. And so I jump in as one of the actresses um, that doesn't have oil in her lamp. So initially, you know, the lights are turned out in the congregation. It's pitch black in the sanctuary. And some of the girls have flashlights. So this kind of like strobe lights are happening in the sanctuary as they're, you know, running around saying, we've got oil in our lamps. We've got oil in our lamps. And um, the girls who don't have flashlights feel kind of silly because we're kind of walking up in the dark to members of our congregation saying, do you have oil for my lamp? And initially I'm not taking it very seriously. I'm kind of like, hi, do you have any oil? I really need some oil. But then something strange happens as I'm in the middle of this play. And um, I begin to think and chew on what it would feel like to to not have oil in my lamp. And so as I'm playing it out, the anxiety kind of rises in my tone. I begin to ask my friends, um, you know, the congregation members, do, do you have oil? Do you have oil in your lamp? I, I need oil. I need oil. And if I don't have oil, I'm not going to be able to welcome the king. Do you have oil? I'm sharing this, running around the congregation until I lock eyes with a particular friend, my friend Jordan, who has like the biggest doe eyes in the world. And I get close to her and something kind of rises up in me. And I look at her, I say, Jordan, do you have any oil? I, I need oil. And in that kind of moment, uh, the clarion moment of truth in the middle of this silly Sunday school play, in the middle of a dark sanctuary, Tears kind of well up in mine and Jordan's eyes. So we sit on this, this line of this play hanging in the air. Do you have any oil? And I think we were both pierced, really pierced to the heart with this idea of moving through life and feeling like ill-prepared to welcome Jesus. Feeling like somewhere along the way we ran out of oil. Somewhere along the way we lost our light. And things got dark. And we were left in an echo chamber screaming, Where's the oil? Where's the oil? Do you know that the church, God's people, are meant to be a political people? I do not mean necessarily that that means the churches need to be paying attention to red states and blue states and jumping behind a candidate and things like that, maybe. But what I mean when I say that the church is called to be a political people means that God has called us to be a people of politic, that word poly, the people of the city, the people of the community, the people who serve the community, the people who serve the neighborhood, that the church is meant to turn a light on. That the church is meant to be like maidens who have oil in their lamps. That when everything is dark, when everything is chaotic, when everything feels 
hopeless and confusing and divisive that the church is called to be a place of healing and light and restoration. This week, I learned about our own Mark, who went out over the last two weeks door to door with the simple, you know, bipartisan task of helping folks get to the polls who didn't have access. He ended up driving 70 people, 70 plus people in to, to the polls. And do you know what happens when people get to vote? They experience a sense of dignity and self-worth and restoration. The reason I wanted to preach today is because this is a National Adoption Month and this Sunday churches across the country are celebrating an adoption awareness campaign. Sometimes when I ask where the oil is, the next question or, or another way to say that question is, what is the oil? What is pure and undefiled religion? What does it look like to, to do good work, to honor God with our days, to do the right thing? And 1 James 27 tells us this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. How do we remain unstained when it feels like there is stain everywhere that we look? where it feels difficult to think through Thanksgiving dinner because we'll be sitting across the table from loved ones that we feel so estranged from because of the political hour that we're in. Mr. Rogers puts it this way. When you're in a time of crisis, look for the helpers. There's always helpers. There's always people that are doing good work. And God makes this claim that good work, pure, undefiled religion means visit the orphans, visit the widows in their affliction. Like our own Mark, who went and did a visit and said, I see you. I see you in your isolation and your vote matters. Your voice counts. Some of you might not know that Pastor Daniel and I are in the middle of our own adoption. We've taken this text a bit literally, and we've sensed God's call over the last decade to widen our family through the vehicle of international adoption. We're adopting from Honduras, where we have been working for years through difficult paperwork and difficult immigration policies, and we've seen our community come around us and raise upwards of $21,000 to help us complete this adoption. And when I'm doing this work, there are many things that make me fearful of completing our adoption. There are things that make me fearful of doing the politic work of visiting the orphan, visiting the, the widow, doing good work. But then I remember I remember what adoption sounds like. Adoption sounds like Jesus, who said, you were once not a people, but now I call you the people of God, who once laid on a cross in order that we might be reconciled back to God the Father. Jesus, who took the one on the edges, the ones on the marginalized places of society, who said, yes, the Jew and also the Gentile will be grafted into my family. 
Jesus, who adopted us as sons and daughters of the living God, co-heirs with Christ, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, that we might proclaim the marvelous light of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. One day I'll sit with my little one, my little one not born of my body, and my little one will probably ask me really, really hard questions. Like, why did you adopt me? Why did you take me from my home country? Why did you do all this work and come all this way and travel and why? And my task will not be to dismiss their pain, to minimize their trauma and say things that don't speak to the space of lament in their heart like, yeah, it is hard that the narrative around your birth parents is unclear. Yes, it, there is pain in being taken from your home country. But I'm also going to be able to look at that little one and speak a word of hope and truth and light and say, I am adopting you because one time I was adopted. I was wandering and I had a sense about me that I didn't know who my people were. And God reached into my life and God claimed me as God's own daughter. And God told me that I had a place in God's kingdom. And so I just want to live that out in my life. In the practical ins and outs, the rhythms, the politic of life with my people, in my community, in my home. I want to be able to look at a little one and say, you belong, you have a place. And so Trinity, family, how do we have oil in our lamps today? How do we even begin to hope when the divisiveness in our country feels so trite? and feel so polarized, and feel so without hope. I invite you into this, to be imitators of Christ, who did not minimize pain. He did not dismiss lament. He did not make us feel small by saying God is in control of it all, but he rather entered our story right where we were and said, let's get to work. Rolled up some sleeves, ate good food, sat with the marginalized, encouraged us to care for the widow, gave example of caring for the orphan, did good work. Trinity, God is calling us to get to work. I don't know what being people of adoption on this National Adoption Sunday looks like for you. I believe for many of us, it means widening the space in our home and creating space for children who have no home to come and experience family. I believe that. I believe that some of you are being called to the work of foster care and adoption. I believe that some of you are being called to go and serve right alongside Open Table and make sure that the people in our community that feel socioeconomically orphaned would have a sense of belonging, a sense of personhood, clothes on their back. I believe that for some of you, it might mean becoming neighbor and friend and driver to the polls for ones that we don't typically rub shoulders with. But I believe this, Trinity, that God has given us oil and that the oil to prepare 
to be people of welcome, people of radical welcome for Jesus, is to go and do good work, to embody adoption, to embody welcome and hospitality and room in our family, to do good work, to be a political people that cares for our town. And I believe that it's in the doing, in the working, in that place that the Spirit of God oils our dry places and teaches us how to be a people of hope and a people of light. Amen. Thank you.